Very interesting things about remembering stuff. We talked about memory this morning, but uh, the timing, when we, when we remember, there's a couple things about memories. The timing in our memories is often off. Uh, things get jumbled together, right? And, and they kind of all mix together, and they, it's hard to pull apart. And when we're younger, right, when we're really young, time takes forever. Because if you could remember when you're six, from Christmas to Christmas lasts about four years, right? I mean, that's what it feels like when you're young, right? Everything, oh my goodness, it takes so long. The school year, you're like, just ask anybody who's in high school or middle school right now and said, are you happy the school year's half over? And they're like, half over? It's been going on forever. It's only February, right? So they have a whole different view. Last year's vacation for someone who's young seems like it was like three years ago already. When you're older and you have more experiences, they begin to clump together. And they kind of all stick together. And our memories get a little bit... And so the timelines in our memories are often unreliable. Just by judging by the fact that you all could identify with that conversation, right? But there's a second thing about memories. Our memories are selective. They're unreliable. It's called memory bias. We have this tendency to only remember certain parts of events or interactions. Uh, We recall certain things and we forget others. And studies have shown, we think memory is kind of like a photograph, right? I have a memory, I remember it clearly, I can picture it in my head, except you can't. You think you can, but you can't. There's a, there's a very fascinating display, if you've ever been to the 9-11 memorial in New York, and if you've ever been there, they have this one section, and what they did is they asked hundreds of people to just paint a blue paper showing the color of the sky as they remember it from that day. Because if you remember, it was a very blue day on that September 11th day. Everyone is different. Nobody's the same. Not even two are the same. Everybody has this kind of picture of what it was. They've done studies after study on this, and people are utterly convinced of something being true, even though they themselves said something different a year or two before. It's kind of funny that way. It's actually why we remember things as being either better than they were or worse than they were when we look back. And yet, God designed us to remember. He designed us with memories. If you remember, if you remember the story, Israel was a new nation. You remember this? And they were, if you read the story, they they were a new nation. God had just freed them from slavery in Egypt. And we've read the stories, but you have to picture what it was like if you were there. I mean, these people had, had only grown up as slaves, But then they saw God, through this whole series of events, begin to perform these miracles, these plagues on the Egyptians. And it was amazing. But they got to see it happen with their own eyes. So they watched as frogs came out of the water, and there were so many that you couldn't take a step without going squish, squish, right? They they were there, and they could smell it when they died. I mean, it was vivid in their minds. They'd seen blackness in the middle of the day. I couldn't even see the hand in front of your face. They saw the Nile turn to blood and not red food-colored water, but that thick blood, coppery, horribly smelling blood. They saw it. They saw it happen. They heard the wails of their Egyptian neighbors, people they knew when the firstborn of Egypt died. I mean, they were there. It was so clear. It was in their heads. And then they had experienced walking out of this land free, being given all the riches of Egypt, and then they could remember that they just got a few days into the wilderness and the Pharaoh changed his mind and came chasing them, and they could remember the panic as they stood on the sea and looked backwards and saw an army and looked forward and thought, we can't swim, and then they remembered how God just went, pulled the waters aside. They got to walk through on dry land, and they got to see the sea come back. They traveled. They saw... Moses hit a rock, and water came from nowhere, enough to feed tens of thousands of people. They saw lightning and thunder on the mountain. They saw Moses' face glowing so that they couldn't even hardly look at it. They were terrified. They were, I mean, these are, these are clear memories. They just happened. I mean, goodness, they collected bread every morning that lay on the ground, heavenly Despite all that, they had disobeyed. They didn't listen. 
and God made them wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Right? You read the stories. He said, look, none of you are going to the promised land. You're going to wander in circles until everybody over the age of 20 dies. And then I'm going to take in all the young people, who will by that point not be young people anymore. And then when they get to the promised land, if you read through this, it's, it's fascinating. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book in the Scriptures. Just before they go into the promised land, you read them recounting everything that happened. And it's amazing how many times, if you read this through, how many times he tells them to remember. Look at this. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And by the way, he's not actually talking to people who were slaves. All the people he's talking to at this point were kids, right? They were teenagers, or, 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 or they hadn't been born yet, or they were adolescents, or even, you know, infants when they came out of Egypt. And he says, I want you to remember you were slaves, that God brought you out. And remember, they'd heard the stories. They'd heard their parents talk about it. There was no television and no YouTube. So when the sun went down and you're sitting in the tent, they're like, hey, Dad, tell us the story again. Tell us what happened. They would describe it all to them. Remember what the Lord your God did. Remember what the Amalekites, whole different story when they attacked them along the way. Remember the days of old. Consider the generations. Remember the command that Moses, the servant of God, gave you. Over and over and over. They're just about to go into the promised land. And then, he said, I want you to remember all this because you're going to go in the promised land. So then they go into the promised land. They have amazing experiences. Miraculous interventions. Battles that you would say, we are never going to forget what God did. I mean, he made the sun stand still, and he killed enemies with hailstones. I mean, we were there. We saw it. And they always forgot. They did not remember the Lord their God. This is not thousands of years later. This is a couple generations. They didn't remember the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. And after hundreds and hundreds of years, when the nation of Israel was destroyed, they had been sold into slavery to Assyria and then to Babylon. Here's what one of the prophets told the people of Israel. He was speaking on the behalf of God. When I fed them, they were satisfied. And when they were satisfied, they became proud. And then they forgot. One of the reasons we do this service every year is it is so easy to forget. And you say, no, I'm not going to forget. I know God's at work. Okay, yeah, that's true. But there's something that remembering specifically does for us. It it, it frames our past experiences rightly. Because the object of our remembering is always God. That's, That's what God's talking about. The purpose of remembering in Scripture when they talk about when God's giving all those instructions to remember, it's not the kind of remembering we often do, which is just to feel melancholy. Oh, that was such a good time in my life. Oh, I wish the kids were little again. You know, like those kind of memories, it's not that. Or that was the best years of our marriage, or that was the best vacation, right? That was the best years of our church. That's not what, that's kind of the remembering they're talking about. God says, I want you to remember because I want you to let it put me in the center. I want, that's what I want. And it happens two ways. We, we, we do this two ways when we remember. One is remembering who God is. And the easiest way to do this, because we say, okay, well, I know who God is, and why would God tell me to remember? It's because he wants us to specifically engage with, okay, who is God really? Because in the day-to-day life, it's just really easy to forget. We don't mean to, but we do. And the easiest way to do this is through Scripture, right? You could just go through, and we could do pages and pages of this. John says he's love. Mark says he's good. Leviticus, we read that he's holy. In 1 John, it says he's light. You know, and then Isaiah says he's gracious, he's merciful, he's faithful, he forgives. I put merciful twice. He's compassionate. You could go on and on and on. This is the God of your life. This is the God of our church. This is the God who knows you. So one of the ways we remember Right? Because the, if, if we want to frame our past correctly, God says, I need to be the center. I need to be the object of that. We do that by remembering who he is. But the other way we do it is by remembering what he's done. So they're both, they're both true. 
There is statement after statement in Scripture about the faithfulness of God where he says, don't you remember? That's what I did. That's how I acted. Don't you remember? I mean, it was amazing. This is, what we, this is how I did. Now, the reason this is so important is when we remember our past experiences through the filter of who God is, it changes everything. Because you can remember something from the past and think, oh, it's so terrible. I can't believe how bad that was. But if you begin by saying, but let me remember who God is first, it can actually reframe your past. I can remember times in my life, a couple of specific ones, where it was not good. I was struggling with being very depressed. I was in a very low place. And if I was just to remember that as it was, I'd think, oh, that was a horrible time. But if I think and remember first that, you know, God is faithful, that God loves me desperately and is drawing me to himself, then I begin to think about those memories and I think, you know, I would never have learned what I learned if it hadn't been for that. If God hadn't allowed me to go through that, I wouldn't be the person I am. If God hadn't arranged or orchestrated things that way, I would have never seen what I see now. And now when I remember, I remember with gratitude. Still tough. It was still difficult times, but it, it's not overwhelming. And sometimes if the memory's good, it just makes it even better. It makes it more complete. Because now you're like, oh God, you are so good. I remember that time. I can't believe you did that for me. Really, really good. You remember that really, really good vacation, you know, the time where the entire family was together and it was just the best time ever and everybody remembers it and you think back and you go, God, you are so, such a good dad to me because look what you did for me. It changes things. That's why we remember. That's why we celebrate what God has done. And so if you have your report, we put a whole bunch of things in here and I'm going to let you read this on your own. You can go cover to cover with this and read every word in here in probably about 15 minutes, maybe less, because it's not that full. We did it that way on purpose because we want you to get a sense for what God is doing in the church. And so you can see 2022 at a glance, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm telling you, guys, there is stuff to celebrate that God did this year. Amazing things. Our attendance uh, on a weekly basis has gone up from last year. In other words, that means more people have been engaged just in general in our church. We've seen 35 kids and youth involved every Wednesday, which is, again, an increase over last year. God is, is reaching into their lives. And then if you, read this, if you hear the stories of how these kids are engaging and how they're listening and they're asking, like, what about this and what does God think about this? And you hear about students who are stepping up to pray over adults. You're like, that's fantastic. God is at work. Do you know that 61 times last year this facility was used by community groups or other places? 61 times. Andy is about ready to die <laughs> because he's here all the time. I mean, it's great. All these people using it, facilities, all kinds of wonderful activities. We had um, things like uh, the Gemstones Prom, and uh, we had private groups come in here, and I don't know, just all kinds of stuff. We had, some of you are new people that came in during this year. You, last, a year ago, you knew nothing about our church or had nothing to do with it, but now you're here. It's fantastic. We were able to send almost $100,000 to support international workers around the world. That's amazing. And you could just go on. And you can see how we break it up by loving God, loving the world, loving others. I mean, there are so many things that we've had happen this year. They're worth celebrating. If you flip over a couple pages, starting on page 5, we have some reflections. And I'm not going to read these because I want you to do that. But we asked some of our, our, our leaders to tell us, like, what are your reflections on 2022? What are some of the things that God has done? And it's from the things that you might consider mundane but are really a big deal, just even in some of the things we were able to do to keep our property up to, to date, to do some of the maintenance things that we had the, the time, the skills with Jim leading it and, and the finances to do that. Uh, the worship team, fantastic. We've had new people step up who have not done this before. That's a good thing. I, I, I find that really exciting. The Youth of Truth has been wonderful. This is our first full year. This is the Wednesday night thing we do with kids. Uh, Eunice and her whole team have done an amazing job with that. Uh, and we've seen kids get excited. When, when Yvonne comes home, she, she leads the worship each week. And she says the kids get loud. They get excited. I mean, they're having fun. They actually like being here where God is being taught. That's a good thing. We've seen giving go up. We've seen prayer increased. Do you know that twice last year we had a 40 hours of prayer? That means 
just in those two events, our people spent 80 hours interceding for our church and for our community. We did a prayer drive, which is about another 40 hours cumulative of praying for our community. That doesn't include the one we just did. This is last year we did this. That is really cool stuff. We have seen marriages challenged and grown. We've seen people deal with health issues where God has moved them in the right direction. We've seen people experience prayer in new ways, being prayed over or praying over people where they've never done that before. (laughs) This is good stuff. And what happens is it's so easy to say, okay, that's all true, but here's what's going on today. And God's like, no, no, I want you to remember. Remember who I am, how amazing I am, how much I love you, and what I've done for you. Let that frame everything you remember about the past. If we forget, you know what happens? If we forget to do this, we make our story about us. And that's our tendency. It's my story. It's my life. And I begin to frame everything out based on what happened to me, what I did, what I accomplished, what worked for me, what didn't work for me, the things I did, the things people did to me, And that becomes the narrative of your life. When we remember, the narrative of our entire story is dictated by who God is and what He's done. 2022, reframe it. It doesn't mean that bad stuff didn't happen, by the way, because there was lots of difficulties in 2022. There were some really difficult things that happened, you know, and you go from one extreme of of death and family problems and all those, all the way up to even the smallest things. It's not that the year didn't have difficulties, but when we remember and we put God in the center of that remembering, it just reframes it out a little bit and helps us to remember in a much more healthy way. It keeps us from wallowing in misery and shame and self-denial, which is what we tend to do when we just focus on ourselves. We focus on God. He lifts us up. So it's a really good thing. I encourage you to do this in your own own life. Make it a discipline of remembering and saying, all right, God, help me remember. And if you remember monthly or quarterly, it's a lot easier because once a year goes by, you're like, really? That was this year? It was, you know. There's some things that I went back and looked at and I thought, wow, I thought that was in 2021. But nope, that was in last year. So God's at work. But there is a second piece to all this because the first part of remembering is it helps frame the past rightly. It, it gives us, uh, it, it helps do that. But here's why that's so important. It frames the past rightly to give us a correct perspective for the future. See, Just as our ability to remember the past can be faulty or misguided, so can our view of what's to come. It's easy to get overwhelmed, depressed, fearful, worried about what might be. Here, a little side plug there. If you're a worrier, uh, we're going to do a Christian growth class starting in a month, uh, first Sunday in March, and the whole class is on worry, not how to worry, We don't need teaching for that, (laughs) but maybe how not to, because we have a tendency to do that. But we look forward. We have this this ability to to, uh, see our future wrongly, and when we remember who God is, we remember what God has done throughout the past, what it does is it actually shapes the future. So that's the second part of remembering, which is it gives us perspective for our future, And and I would say it does that in a couple different ways. First, it actually leads us to trust and obedience. When God told the Israelites, as they went into the promised land, to walk around Jericho every day for seven days. And by the way, when you do that, you're going to end up conquering the city. Do you know why they could do that? Because they had seen God work. They just watched him part the waters of the Jordan. Kind of made them remember the Red Sea, part of the waters of the Jordan. They had just seen all these miracles. They'd come into the promised land, and God was like, all right, guys, now it's game on. Let's go. They could do that because they'd seen them work over and over. When he said, oh, by the way, I want you to go against kings that are much more powerful than you. If you ever read the book of Joshua, little confession here, Joshua was my favorite book when my dad preached and I was bored, okay? Because we didn't have phones, so I would read my Bible because that looked really good. And I would read the lists of all the battles and the kings that Joshua would conquer. But it's made that stick in my head because when you look at what Israel did, they're this small nation that's coming in against 
Tons and tons of people, big armies. And when God said, I want you to go after them, do you know why they could? Because he proved that he could do it before. Because they could remember. The knowledge that God has been utterly faithful at Atlanta Road Alliance Church for 40 years should allow us to look at 2023 and say, game on. Let's go. God is faithful. It doesn't matter whether you're here for all 40 years or not. I mean, I'm not even 40, so I wouldn't have even been alive when this thing started. <laughs> It doesn't really matter if you've been here or not. You still remember. You're like, okay, I heard the stories. I've heard people remember. This is really good. The provision that he's provided over and over in finances, in people, should give us the confidence to go forward knowing that he will provide whatever it is he calls us to do. And his presence when we've risked before, which we have, should give us confidence that when we risk again, His presence will still be there. When we remember rightly, what it does, it leads us to trust and obedience for the future. And that's because God's character is what frames everything he does. God does nothing contrary to his character. You know we're not like that. You you, you know people that you say, you know what, they're really a nice person, but that was really a bad move, right? You know people like that. You're like, oh yeah, I know they're pretty good people, and I I like them, and I'm like, yeah, but that that was not really them. They kind of went outside their character on that one. That never happens. You can never say that about God. God is loving, faithful, holy, just, perfect, involved, and everything he does is always framed out in that character. That's why when we remember his character and we look forward, we go, well, he's going to do the same thing. It doesn't matter if I understand it or not or I see it. That's how God operates. And you know this works, by the way. Because if you've ever had a best friend, someone you've known for years, you know that they love you dearly, you've shared your life with them, and then something happens and your first thought is, what is wrong with them? Why are they saying that to me? Why? Do they have it in for me? And if you take a moment to take a step back, you go, no, no, no. I know that's not true. I know they love me. I trust them. We've known each other for 30 years. They have my best interest at heart. I must be reading this wrong. And then you go have the conversation. It gets explained. You're like, oh, yeah, I was reading that wrong. That's what we do with God. God, what are you doing? God, I don't understand. God, you've forgotten. Why would you let this happen to my family? Why are you doing this to my life? We have to take a, take a step back and go, no, no, remember? I remember God's character and what he's done. And that's how he operates in the future. So I trust you, God. Trust and obedience. But here's the other thing. When we remember well, the perspective it gives for the future is the ability to embrace new things. There's this great verse in Ephesians. You've all probably heard it if you've been around the church for a long time, but maybe it's new to you. Paul was writing it, and he was writing it almost like a little benediction in the middle of this letter that he was writing to the Ephesian church. And he said, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Now, we often focus in that verse on the first part, which is he can do immeasurably more than all we ever ask or imagine. We're like, wow, what a great promise. Do you know that if he does something that we can't imagine, that means it's going to be different and new. And we don't like that sometimes. But have you ever thought that if God did things the same way, then it wouldn't be immeasurably great? It wouldn't be awesome? We're like, yeah, that's what God always does. I like that. I'm comfortable. That's what I like. That's how I like church. That's how I like my life. I don't want God to do something new and amazing and big because it's uncomfortable. But when we begin to say, well, hold on, though. God, we remember who he is and what he's done. We remember his character. It's leading me to trust him. Then you know what? I can step into something new with the confidence that God is there. When our focus is on remembering the old days what they were like, how much we liked them. And by the way, you do not have to be old to remember that. Because when my kids were 12, they would say, oh, I just love the good old days we did this at Christmas. I'm like, you're 12. How do you have have good old days? (laughs) So this can happen at any age. But when we remember that way, and how much we liked them, and how much we want to be like that, then we miss the fact that God wants to do something new. And when the focus is on God and what He's done, then we can appreciate and celebrate and even leverage our past without being afraid of the future. Do you know the entire story of the early church was this? 
because they didn't know. There was no church. Like, we at least go back and say, well, the early church did this. You know, we have entire movements to say, well, it's an Acts 2 church, and we have all the scriptures. Do you know what the Acts 2 church didn't have? Acts 2. Okay? So they're making this up. They're listening to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's saying, I want you to do something completely different. I want you to go off and do this. Oh, by the way, I want you to do life this way. No, you're not doing the Sabbath anymore. You're not doing it this way anymore. I want you to actually help the Gentiles. And every time something new came up, they said, we can't do that. It's never been done that way before. That's uncomfortable. God said, but I'm doing something new. I'm doing something good. And the people trusted him, and they followed him. So what are you imagining for 2023? We just spent the entire weekend as, a, as an elder board. We go away for an annual retreat, for those of you that don't know. Um, and I tell the guys when we go away, it has a multiple purposes. One is just to, to retreat, to get away, to have a chance to, to unpack with each other, to, to be encouraged. Uh, we do some leadership training where we try and grow our skills at what it looks like to be a good leader. And we vision for the church. We say, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in that Ladder Road Alliance Church? How are we supposed to participate with you? What are the things that you're going to do? You've proven yourself faithful. We remember all these things. But if you're going to do something new, what does that look like? We've talked through the entire month of January what that looks like a little bit. We said we're a church that invites people to come as they are and be changed. In what three areas? Do you remember? In loving God, loving and loving the world. Right? Loving God, loving each other, loving the world. We said so we want to grow in those areas, and it's not going to look the same. Some of it will, but some will be different. And so you're going to hear a lot more about these, and I'm not going to take a ton of time. You have to stay for lunch if you want to hear a little more. Um, but we want to do those things. So when we look at 2023, we say, okay, God, where are you taking us? What's, what's going on? What are you, invite, what are you asking us? What are you, where are you leading? Because remember, we're just trying to go where God's already at work. We're not trying to do something new. We're saying, God, where are you at work? Let's go there, because then you can do all the hard work, and we'll just follow along behind you. We're going to double down on this idea of being a praying church. I have seen and listened to my leaders this year tell stories of things that only reason they happened is because people prayed. It's not because we did anything. It's not because we had an immeasurable talent or the art of speaking the right thing at the right time, it's because we prayed. And all of a sudden, people who had never asked a question about God said, hey, you know what, I had a question about that. You're like, really? Huh, who knew? Or blessings came out of left field, or job situations changed. Marriages began to be changed and restored, all because people prayed. If nothing is said about us except that we are a praying church, that's a good thing. But because we're going to highlight this, and you'll hear more about this in the weeks to come, uh, it's going to look a little different. And we're going to be encouraging some interesting things in this that I think we're very excited about, and we hope you will be too. But that's not just it. We also want to be a serving church. Uh, you guys are, are so good at um, helping and serving. Serving is really the way that Jesus said that we love each other. Right? You know that because at the Last Supper when he wanted to demonstrate his love for them, what did he do? He washed their feet. He said, hold on, I'm going to show you how much I love you by serving you. And so we want to always be known as a church that serves, that is not all about ourselves. And I know, because I've heard the stories, that there have been different seasons in Atlanta Road Alliance Church where it's been all about serving. And then there's been some times where it's kind of turned a little bit inwards and the service has been mostly for us and not anybody else. We just want to be a people that serve everybody. However God leads us, we're going to do what he calls us to do. And so we're going to be talking about what does that look like. We want to be a church uh, that serves people that don't know Jesus, people that do. And we want to be an inviting church. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on the weekend, and I sent an article out to our leaders uh, some time ago. I actually got it from one of you. I can't remember who. It said, we need to stop being a welcoming church and become an inviting church. And the reason they said that was they said, to say we're a welcoming church puts the onus on everybody else. Hey, if you come, we'll be welcoming. Inviting says, we got to go and invite and be active and engage and say, we want you to be part of our lives. Not just here on Sunday, but the things we do in our homes and in our families and in our life groups and in all the different things we do. So we want to be an inviting church. 